my name is Roisin and welcome or welcome back to my channel. So today is part three in my Read Around the World series. So I have already read books from Southern Africa, books from uh, Maori, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander authors and now I'm reading books from Central Asia. So I'm going to be reading books from Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, uh, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan. I believe that is all of the countries. Um, but as usual, when I make these videos, the Google Sheets doc um, will be linked in the description. So you can go and see all of the recommendations that I found for these countries for books that have been translated into English. Of course, Afghanistan has been in the news a lot recently um, because of the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan and the Taliban's taking over of that country. Um, I couldn't really make a video about a country like Afghanistan without mentioning it. And there will be links in the description to information and to places that you can help refugees from Afghanistan if you are so able. So let's get into the books I'm talking about. I, when I do these videos, I try to pick a range of books. Obviously some countries are easier than others and some countries like Tajikistan, I couldn't find a single book that had been translated into English. And I'm always limited as to what I have available around me. So the books that I'm planning to read are The Burning Tigress, A History of the Ar Armenian Genocide by Peter Balakian. There were a lot of Armenian books that I found listed, um, but I decided I wanted to read some non-fiction. The Armenian Genocide is something that I've heard of, um, but I don't know very much about at all. And that is something that I feel like I need to rectify. Um, it is one of the defining parts of Armenia's history. And so something that I feel like I needed the um, context for before I read any of the fiction. I think that a lot of fiction was also based around this period of history and um, so I wanted to begin my Armenian journey by reading some Armenian history by an Armenian writer. So this is the story of the Armenian of the Armenians from the dying days of the empire and the early years of modern Turkey, one of shocking and tragic modernity. In this book Peter Balakian reveals the three stages of persecution of the Armenian people from the relatively small scale massacres under the last Sultan, Abdul Hamid II, to the ethnic cleansing undertaken by the forces of the Committee of, the U of Union and Progress under the cover of the First World War. Balakian makes use of eyewitness accounts of US diplomats and missionaries and the terrible testimony of persecutors themselves during the short-lived trials of the 1920s. I think this is, this is quite a chunky book, although the end, um, as it is non-fiction, uh, quite a large amount of the end is sources that's all sources so this is the actual uh, book that I'll be reading um, and obviously this is going to be quite hard going but that is the book that I'm planning to read from Armenia. Then um, from Uzbekistan um, some of these some of these countries had pretty much one author who is translated from that country into English and for Uzbekistan that is Hamid Ismailov and I'm planning to read The Dead Lake. So this is just a little novella and this is actually set in Kazakhstan. Um, Hamid Ismailov was born in Kazakhstan, grew up in Uzbekistan, also lived in Russia and wrote in Russian um, as part of the Soviet Union. And this is a piece of historical fiction I believe yeah, it was first published in 2011, but it's set under the Soviet Union. Uh, and it is about a boy named Yerjan who is growing up in Kazakhstan um, with his family in a very small community, um, a small rural community close to the place where the Russians test atomic weapons. Um, and as a young boy, he falls in love with a neighbor's daughter and one evening to impress her, dives into a forbidden lake. The radioactive water changes him. He will never grow into a man while the girl he loves will become a beautiful woman. Um, so we're following his story um, and the environmental and human cost of the uh, Soviet treatment of the Central Asian countries. Then I am also planning to read from Kyrgyzstan, a classic by Chinggis Eitmatov, who was pretty much the only uh, Kyrgyz author that has been translated into English, and that is Jamila or Jamilia. I believe that Jamila is the Kyrgyz and Jamilia is the Russian. Um, and this is a story, um, this has been touted as the greatest love story ever told. It's another novella, another um, kind of long, for, long short story, if that makes any sense, um, about a woman who is married but who falls in love with a crippled soldier during the Second World War. Inconsistent at best, uh, during the Second World War in Kyrgyzstan and it's told from the perspective of a young artist 
And then um, from Kazakhstan, I am planning to read The Dead Wonder in the Desert by Roland Seisenbayev. And this, like The Dead Lake, is based around a lake in um, Kazakhstan that is slowly evaporating uh, that because of the, again, because of the environmental treatment of Central Asia by the Soviet Union. It's another piece of historical fiction, this time an epic, um, about uh, a man, Nazir, who is a mullah in Kazakhstan and his son, who is uh, campaigning to try and protect this lake that is going um, extinct and that this lake, lake that is disappearing and the effect that that is having on the lives of the fishermen who live by the side of this lake. This one is told in the style of a traditional Kazakh oral storytelling um, and so I imagine it will go off on lots of tangents and come back um, like an epic story often does uh, and so I'm looking forward to reading that one. And then finally uh, from Afghanistan, I am planning to read Sparks Like Stars by Nadia Hashimi. Um, this was, Afghanistan was the only country where I could find a woman who had written a book, uh, so I decided I had to read a book by a woman, um, so that would be at least one in this vlog. Sparks Like Stars tells the story of a girl who is the daughter of one of the advisors of the president of Afghanistan before the Russian invasion in the late 1970s. Her whole family is killed and it, her whole family is killed in a coup and she escapes uh, as a refugee to America where she becomes a surgeon. Um, but in 2008 she decides she has to go back to Afghanistan and uncover the secrets of what really happened to her family um, and why she was able to survive. I know more about recent Afghan history that I've heard about in the news in my lifetime than I do about what happened during the Soviet Union, except that I know that it was one of the battle lines between the West and the US and the Soviets during that time. Um, so it will be interesting again to read some historical fiction, although this time with a 2008 perspective. Um, because this was written before the current uh, time I, and set in 2008, I am intrigued to see how it talks about US intervention in Afghanistan. But without further ado, let's get into the actual reading. This morning I am going to a supermarket so I can get some food to make some uh, things from the Samarkand cookbook. This one. So yeah, I'll tell you what I'm making when I get back, but I'm also going to get a teapot because um, tea is very important in this part of the world. I really wish I had a samovar, um, but I don't have a samovar and I don't think I'm going to find one in the cancer research shop, but I should find a teapot because I broke the lid of my teapot. Oh, or my partner broke the lid of my teapot actually. Um, anyway, so I will see you in a bit. <laughs> So I am back from the supermarket now. I have got everything I need. Oh, uh, I have got a teapot as well. Um, it's not quite the style I wanted. Like, I don't know if you can see that. I wanted a floral one, but I kind of wanted a blue and white floral one or a red one with like folklore style stuff, patterns on it I thought would look better. But this was the nicest one they had. So got that one for my tea. Um, so I'm gonna, like clean up the kitchen a little bit before I start making anything. Um, I've got a um, Uzbek Kazakh tea and an Armenian tea to make and I thought I'd pick that because I'm reading a Kazakh author, Uzbek author, Armenian author. I thought that would be the most appropriate for the books that I'm reading before I start making food. So I'm going to make plov which is like pilaf um, I think and it's kind of it's a staple across Central Asia. There are different ones depending on which country you're in. The one I'm making is Samarkand plov um, which is what this this is Samarkand. Samarkand is in Uzbekistan, um, but I think Uzbek and Kazakh food is quite similar. But that, so it is quite a common like thing from around this part of the world. I'm just going to use the recipe for the standard one. Then I'm also going to make a tomato salad like that, which is Uzbekistani, and I'm going to make massaged cabbage from Kazakhstan. I will <laughs> try and make those. Show you me making them. Um, serve them up you'll get a good look at what those look like but I've also been reading some of the um like the the travel writing parts of this summer can so this is a written by two people uh Caroline Eden and Eleanor Ford and Eleanor Ford writes the recipes Caroline Eden writes um the traveling and about the part of the world so it's a kind of a good overview of some of the stuff that I haven't been able to get from the fiction and non-fiction that I'm reading 
Um, so yes, like I said, I'm going to listen to some more audiobooks whilst I clean up this kitchen and then probably I will make some tea. Um, it's a little early to start on dinner yet. Hello, um, I've been really terrible at reading for this vlog so far. Um, I've started three books but I'm not very far into any of them yet and I hoped to be a little bit further by this point but there we go, that's what always happens. Um, Sorry, I've got a migraine. Um, so I started Sparks Like Stars by Nadia, I can't remember. Um, and this is the novel set in Afghanistan. Um, a, I'm enjoying it more than I thought I might, actually. Um, it's very plain, like the, the, the language itself, there's not much beauty to it. Although there already has been some sort of commentary about Afghanistan and like how it's been passed back and forth between different like peoples and used as a pawn kind of which I think is quite interesting um, and I'm enjoying that I think part of the reason I'm enjoying it so much is that I'm listening to the audiobook and the performance is really good um, so I'm enjoying that but we're about to get to the point of um, this woman going to America girl she's a girl um, she's the daughter of one of the advisors of, of the president who was killed in a coup and she's the only survivor um, and yeah she's been at this American's house. Um, the actual like logistics of the story seem a little far-fetched but um, aside from that it is I am kind of enjoying it. It's a very plot heavy book uh, but it's not taking up too much of my brain because the other book that I'm reading right now is um, The Dead Wanderer in the Desert by Roland Sazenbaev. I am halfway through Sparks Like Stars uh, by Nadia Hashimi which is the book set in Afghanistan about a girl who is uh, whose father was the president of Afghanistan's um, advisor in the 1970s. Uh, so we're talking about the 70s coup and I think the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and then the Americans uh, arming the Taliban, that kind of era. Um, but she's now in America, this woman, this girl. She um, escaped basically and sought refuge in America. And now we flash forward into the future in 2008. Um, so post-American invasion of Afghanistan in 2001. That's uh, what I'm reading so far. The writing style isn't my favourite, a very simple writing style. It's definitely more of a plot focused book. Um, I guess there's some character focus in it as well, but really only for the main character. The other characters aren't that well fleshed out. There's also a lot of like black and white thinking in it. There's definitely villainous people and good guys, um, which is not something I usually enjoy in fiction. It doesn't feel, it feels like not an easy read because you know, it's about war and murder and sexual assault um so there's a lot of difficult things in it but it's not sort of a book club pick like an oprah or reese's book club pick kind of a book uh commercial harrowing americans as the good guys i guess kind of um so i'm, I'm still int going to listen to the rest of it i'm not going to dnf it um it's not a bad book it just doesn't have that much going for it uh everything is a little not melodramatic actually, I wouldn't say it was melodramatic. I think that it is quite well told from the perspective of the child. It's just, I was I kind of thought that the mystery would unfold with us flashing back and forward between the two timelines. Maybe that's just because that's what I'm used to reading. This one is very much, this was the child's timeline, now we're in the future. Um, where we did this whole thing chronologically and now we've hopped forwards and now we're doing that bit chronologically. Um, so there's not a lot I have to say about it because it feels like a very simple book. So it doesn't feel like there's much to discuss. Um, and I prefer books that are have a bit of meat to them and I don't feel like this one does. Hello, I haven't spoken to you for a few days now, um, but I have finished Sparks Like Stars by Nadia Hashimi and The Dead Wanderer in the Desert by Roland Sazenbaev. Um, so I thought I would talk to you about both of those. I don't know how I edited this, I might have split them up. But so Spark Like Stars was kind of what I expected it to be. Um, it wasn't, I thought it might be a bit cheesier than it was, um, but it wasn't too cheesy, I didn't think. Um, I thought it was competently written, although not with any sort of beauty, just quite simple. Uh, the occasional overwrought simile, but not too bad. Just fine, sort of acceptable writing that doesn't make you cringe too much, but also doesn't really stand out, um, which isn't my preference. I generally prefer more beautiful lyrical writing, which this really wasn't. Um, it also tried to 
talk a little bit about the complexity of Afghanistan and America's role in Afghanistan, um, considering that I th I've talked to you about this book before, so you know, it's about a woman who lived in Afghanistan, escaped um, during the 1978, during a 1978 coup um, before the Russian invasion and uh, ended up being adopted in America and then going back um, in 2008. Um, and there was a journalist character who was a war correspondent who talked a little bit about the complexities of America's involvement in Afghanistan and also a diplomat who kind of gave the other side but it was very very minor but it wasn't too like pro-America propaganda um, I guess because it was published in 2021 and not 2008 or 2001 um, so the, the general story of Afghanistan is different now than it was before. Um, which of course has been in the news a lot lately uh, but yeah overall I just thought it was okay I kind of wish I'd read something more beautiful from Afghanistan I'm sure there is lots of literature that would have been that um, but what I had access to was Khalid Hosseini and Nadia Hashimi and I've read The Kite Runner and didn't love it so um, I wanted to try something else but um, yeah it was very light touch um, when it came to talking about things like gender and Afghanistan and uh, foreign policy and stuff, of course it was not really about that. Um, and Nadia Hashimi herself um, put, said she put more of herself in this work than she ever had done in the past. Um, but the, a lot of the plot did just feel quite convenient as well. Um, it's not really my style of book either, it's very much like a commercial fiction book. Um, and I prefer something a bit more slow paced and internal. This felt some bit that were just like shoved in there for no reason um but overall yeah it was fine it was fine <laughs> leaf earl grey but i couldn't find any loose leaf earl grey in the supermarket so i've used assam instead so there's no bergamot um i'm going to be reading the dead lake either tomorrow afternoon or on sunday so when i read that i will maybe make this again um and use an earl grey tea bag um because i do have those again it's going to be really hot because there's no milk but okay i think the assam's a little too overpowering um the other one before didn't have any tea in it and so it tasted very much of spices this one tastes a lot of um assam yeah those spices are kind of in the background but it's not bad i'll try it with the oh grey and see if it's better that way because the other book that i'm reading right now is um the dead wander in the desert by roland sazenbaev remember that name uh who is a kazakhstani author and this is about the drying up of a lake in kazakhstan which is interesting because there's another one called the dead lake um by an uzbek author that i think is set in kazakhstan though um and i'm wondering if it's the same lake if we're talking about the same lake um but anyway this one is told in a really interesting way um and there's a whole translator's note that talks about the oral tradition of kazakhstan um the songs there's lots of songs in this and how like performing songs is a big part of kazakh tradition and also about like the way that they tell stories in this non-linear oral tradition um and the wanting to make this novel in the style of that form 
um, which is interesting and being done really well, but it does mean that things kind of flash back and forward in time in a very fluid way, which is good, like really works well with all the like liquid water themes. Um, so I'm enjoying that. Um, and it's really well written, but I am having trouble remembering who everyone is. Like Nazine, I remember who he is. Nazarene, I remember who he is, but I don't remember who any of the rest of them are. And it is, I only have the audiobook and it's taking quite a lot of effort of concentration to listen to. Like it's really beautiful, um, but it is taking me paying all of my attention to it. <laughs> a book that definitely does have meat to it though is uh, And the Dead Wander of the Desert by um, Roland Seisenbaev, which is the one set in Kazakhstan about a sea, a, a really big lake that they call the sea. Kazakhstan, which is a landlocked country, and it's drying out and the people who live in on the lake's edge and them trying to deal with it. Very, very interesting book. I'm really, really enjoying it. I do wish I had the physical copy rather than the audiobook, which is unusual for me to say because I'm definitely an audiobook preference kind of person. I love an audiobook. Um, but I am struggling to retain everything. Like I couldn't listen to it whilst I was in the supermarket, for example, because most audiobooks I can like focus about 60% of my brain on the audiobook and 40% on what I'm doing. Um, but this one needs at least 80% of my brain. Like I need to only be doing activities that take no brain or else I really lose my place. It's told in a really interesting way. As I think I mentioned, um, it like darts off on tangents and when people say something that sparks a memory we go back into that memory because it is supposed to be told in the way of oral storytelling um with the like history and the context and different stories about different people being we we woven into the main narrative um it's kind of reminding me a little bit of uh, Summer Light and Then Comes the Night by Jon Kalman Stephenson because of that narrative style or Fish Have No Feet by Jon Kalman Stephenson more so actually because of that narrative style um, and because of the slight detachment I think that it has but in a way that I enjoy it. I don't often like detachment from the focus but I think that it's about alienation um, and the alienation of these people from their um, home although again it's talked about there was an American character who was like well in America we respect the nature around us and it's like really do you um I mean I know the Soviets haven't done a good job of that either but uh the idea that America's better is a bit surprising yeah I'm enjoying the bits where they're in like arguments with the Soviet state I think it's really interesting um well done there's like political parts of it uh as well as really small human stories a little bit of misogyny uh a little bit of misogyny of how are women these days don't let their men be entirely heads of the household. It was just a passing comment. Um, men have lost their support because women want uh, agency. Um, <laughs> so that was, but it, it hasn't really detracted from the story. And obviously like you can have a character who thinks that without, but that was the narrator, not a character. Um, so I don't, it was just a little annoying, but it's, it's a very minor thing. This is a very masculine book. It's very much focused on the men in this situation. There are women spoken about as well, but it's much more a masculine focus. Um, but I am enjoying it. It's really, really beautifully written. I'm really liking it. And it's very, there's a lot in this one, a lot more to think about. There's kind of almost fabulous elements of these fish that like, like, like big fish, actually, this fish that follows him through his life. It's really good. Um, yeah i'm definitely really enjoying that hello i haven't spoken to you for a few days now um but i have finished sparks like stars by nadia hashimi and the dead wanderer in the desert by roland seisenbaev um so i thought i would talk to you about both of those um the dead wanderer in the desert is like the complete opposite very beautiful a lot of beautiful writing um i guess i would describe it kind of as an epic um it focuses on uh, one family, um, Nazir and his son, ha, I cannot remember his name because of an H, cannot remember it. And it is in Kazakhstan. Um, and this, it kind of, it, it very meandering, but it's, it's, as I think I mentioned earlier, kind of written in the style of Kazakhstan um, nomadic, like oral tradition rather than, um, anything else and I thought it was really beautiful um, but a little confusing. I did find it, especially be probably because I listened to the audiobook, I struggled with who everyone was um, and okay I, I got a bit confused sometimes and I also felt like it was very long um, but it was very clever, very well done. Um, I really enjoyed the, there were 
every so often there'd be these this interpolation of headlines from news stories from around the world so the focus of this book is about a sea that is drying up in Kazakhstan um, because of the Soviet Union like re-diverting water um, and wanting to build to like grow cotton and rice instead of have the sea there and then also their um, nuclear testing in Kazakhstan and how this affects the people who live nearby and the illnesses that happen from that so it's kind of about um, man's messing with nature it's about um, Soviet Union and um, authoritarian regimes and their disregard for people um, it's about there's uprisings um, there's like protests and it's about how that's dealt with in Kazakhstan under the Soviet Union um, but the news the news stories that are interpolated are from around the world and it's kind of talking about how we're so focused in the story on Kazakhstan and on this tiny place in Kazakhstan and on these two families and their experience of the Soviet Union in this really epic way where we follow their family history and we follow them through this but then these stories will interpolate what's going on in the rest of the world and it's helpful for me as someone who doesn't know Kazakhstan very well placing this in history because the ending is like in 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall and there's a lot of talk actually about Afghanistan which is really interesting considering Sparks Like Stars it talks about how many Kazakh soldiers died in Afghanistan uh, during the Soviet invasion um, and they were just like cannon fodder um, which I didn't know anything about Kazakhstan at all so all of this history was really interesting to learn but like I'm saying about the news stories sorry I feel like I'm telling this the same way as this um, story with meandering and off in tangents but the news stories are from around the world and so it talks about like a um, forest fire, a tyre fire in Canada and um, nuclear testing in Nevada, how the Americans are doing the same things as the Soviet Union in, Nova in Kazakhstan in Nevada um, and even with this uprising against uh, this sort of protest that turned violent when the uh, Russians started to attack, the Russian like the USSR soldiers started to attack the Kazakhs but also there was this sectarian like um, ethnic violence, this building up of the Kazakhs as the bad people because they're Kazakh so that Russian people would feel violently towards them and he starts talking about Ulster and how like the the relation of it to what the British are doing in Northern Ireland it's very interesting the way that the parallels were drawn um, whilst at the same time it being so closely focused on this one family so yeah it's um I'm, I'm gonna obviously I tend to do a wrap-up at the end of these videos and this is one of those books that I think I need to really focus on and think about um, and come back to you with some more thoughts, maybe read some reviews so I can really meditate on my thoughts because as I said um, I would get a bit lost sometimes, I did find it quite long um, and I did find myself not wanting to go back to it and not because I wasn't enjoying it but because it requires so much focus and so much brain power but it's a book that I think would bear rereading. So um, I still have <laughs> four books to finish and this video was supposed to go up today which obviously it's night time a different video went up today
so I've got my dinner here. I will show you a clip of it. Um, so I think that the rice is perfectly cooked, but the plov was like a bit wetter, I think, than it's supposed to be. I feel like the um I feel like the water should have cooked off a bit more, um, judging by like biryani and other pilafs that I've had in the past. So not sure I did that quite right. I've also got a massaged cabbage thing which is uh, cabbage, carrots, chilli, um, coriander and dill uh, and with vinegar and salt and sugar. And then I've got this other salad, I will show you, which is tomatoes, onions, again, coriander and dill. Um, and they call it sweet hottie in Uzbekistan. So I think this is mostly an Uzbek plate. Um, and I haven't read an Uzbek book yet, but I'm looking forward to trying it. So, right, so I'm going to try the plov. Very hot. It's nice. It's well cooked. It's very mild. Um, the book, Samarkand, said that um, the spices are quite mild in that country. They, in the Central Asia in general, there's not, it's not like hugely spiced food. Um, it's quite sparing use of it. I don't, obviously, I don't know how authentic this is because it's just from a cookbook. Um, so maybe if anyone knows, let me know how much I can make it more authentic. I've got the um the cabbage salad yeah that's nice again um it's, i like all the fresh herbs in it it's really good but it's kind of like a, a slaw kind of situation i would probably put more vinegar and salt on that if i made it again and then the sweet hottie that one's really tasty i really like that one so i'm gonna eat this i'm just about to finish box like stars so i won't talk to you while i'm eating because i hate it when people talk while they're eating but i'll get back to you in a minute I have my Uzbek tea, um, uh, the one that I made before, but this time I've used Earl Grey tea bags instead of um, the loose Assam. I would say that this time very much mint is the flavour that I'm getting, um, but uh, it's it's nice. Um, I don't think it's my favourite. It kind of makes my mouth dry, um, which is intriguing. I don't know if it's like oregano. I can taste the oregano actually this time. I feel like the herbs the Earl Grey isn't overpowering the herbs as much as the Assam did. Maybe that's because the Assam was loose leaf and this is a tea bag. It's also decaf Earl Grey because it's like eight in the evening. But anyway, I've got my Uzbek tea and I'm gonna read my Uzbek books. So I'm gonna read The Dead Lake by Hamid Ismailov, which is, he's an Uzbek writer, but this is set in Kazakhstan. And it's actually about the environmental legacy of the Cold War, which is what The Dead Wanderer in the Desert was about. Um, and it is about the, um, between 1949 and 1989, at the, uh, at the nuclear test site, a total of 468 nuclear explosions were carried out, comprising of 125 atomic, 125 atmospheric, and 343 underground blasts. The aggregated yield of the nuclear devices tested in the atmosphere and underground at the SNTS in a populated region exceeded by a factor of 2,500 the power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima by the Americans in 1945. So it is set um, in Kazakhstan and it is about a similar thing, although obviously that was epic and this is less than 100 pages. This is a novella. So I'm going to read this and then I'm also going to try and read Jamelia by oh, Chingiz. <sighs> Hamid Ismailov. Chingiz Etmov, which is a short, short love story that I have on script. Um, as an ebook, so I'm going to try and read both of these whilst I drink my pot of tea. Yes, I have an entire pot. Um, I might not manage to get through all of it, but hopefully I'll get back to you. And then I've just got the two non-fictions for the end because, of course, I do. Of course, that's the books that I struggle to get to. I'll get back to you later. Hello. It is a different day, I promise. We're just still in my living room, um, so I haven't spoken to you for a while either. So I am currently halfway through um the burning tigress uh which is the book about the armenian genocide that i'm reading uh i have finished jamila or jamilia which is the kyrgyzstani short story that i was reading so i read that in one sitting and i've also finished the dead lake by hamid ismailov so i finished this one as well so i'm going to talk to you about um jamila jamilia um apparently jamila is kyrgyz jamilia is russian um and um, this one as well that I'd like, which I've also read. So then I also read the short story Jamilia, Jamila, um, and 
I just feel kind of meh about that. Um, it was described as the greatest love story of all time, and I don't think that you can really call it that. People like the characters have no depth to them, um, and the relationship is just kind of quite sudden. Um, I mean, it's a short story, but it's not even told from the perspective of either of the people in the relationship. It's told from um, the woman's brother-in-law, uh, who's just watching them. Um, there is some beautiful writing involved, but as always with translation, it's hard to know how much of it is because of the translation. It's not a story, like, there isn't a huge amount of Kyrgyzstani writing that's been translated into English. So it, he, Chinggis Eitmatov is pretty much the only person, uh, and this is like his seminal work. So if you are trying to read Kyrgyzstani authors, I think that's pretty much the only reason I would recommend this book. Um, because it's fine, there's nothing wrong with it, and there's some beautiful aspects of the description of the Kyrgyzstani landscape that I thought was really lovely. Um, but for the most part, I don't, <laughs> like, I wouldn't even know how to give this a rating. Um, it's just kind of a nothing story. I don't really know how to describe what I'm talking about, but yeah, it was very short. Um, aside from some beautiful writing, there wasn't much to it. Um, it reminded me a little bit of Russian short stories that I've read, so I suppose that maybe it is in the tradition of that. Like I read, last year I read Lady Macbeth of Matensk. It similarly got that like stock characters archetype feeling, and I suppose it was more about soldiers in the Second World War and the treatment of Central Asian, Asian soldiers and the, um, because like, if you see a uh, infographic about the amount of people who died from each country involved in the Second World War, Russia is like more than everyone can put together. And obviously Russia at the time means the USSR. So it means people who wouldn't consider themselves Russian, like, Kyrgyz, Kazakh and Uzbek people um, and how people were cannon fodder and had no boots or helmets and things like that. So the um, the disabilization is that a word? Um, just the amount of disabled men who came back and the effect that that had on the um, population as a whole, which is something that came up again in um, The Dead Bond of the Desert and in the Dead Lake. So this talks about how there are um, both of, in both all three of them there are men who've come back from the front and the, what happened in war and then there was also what happens in the Soviet Union afterwards. Um, the Dead Lake and the Dead Who Wander the Desert um, are both about the um, like the nuclear testing that happened in Kazakhstan uh, under the, during the Cold War in the Soviet Union and um, other like environmental disasters. Um, so the Dead Wand of the Desert has the environmental disasters and also the way that that affected people and caused disabilities, disfigurements and um, cancer. And this is much more about the illnesses. Um, and it's about two, one family kind of, two branches of one family who live in this very isolated place in Kazakhstan, where there's no one else there, it's just a train station. Um, the way that the test center which they are near and which one of the uncle works at the way that that affects them and um, this book again had some really really beautiful writing it kind of re reminded me of one of those art house films that you watch and you're like well this is very very beautiful but i have no idea what i just watched and in the same way this was very beautifully written but i have no idea what i read i have no idea what was going on one guy um yoshan He's a musician and he's on this train and he meets this other man and he tells him the story of why he still looks like a 12 year old boy, even though he's 27. Um, because, and it's because he swam in this lake that was inside the testing center and they were all told not to go in the water, but he swam in the lake. His life, so it tells us of his life leading up to that and then also of his life afterwards and what happened to his family. Um, trigger warnings for a lot of like um, cancer and serious illness and also for incest, I think, but I can't be 100% sure. I think that's what happened, but it's hard for me to make out who everyone actually was and how they were related to one another. So potentially, but potentially not. But yeah, it was really, really an interesting read in terms of being a slice of life about the brutality of just the landscape and the treatment of Kazakhs in a very like detached bureaucratic way. Um, like compared to the Armenian genocide, which is very like active, this is kind of almost a passive destruction of people as if they don't exist and they complete like it's kind of satirical kind of funny um absurdist surreal humor i would say on top of all this like 
So there's some very funny moments, um, but they're in such a bizarre, weird way. Uh, and it is very beautifully written. This one, I would say I would recommend, um, but if you're coming for a story, don't read this, but for an understanding, for like a look at Kazakhstan under the Soviet Union um, and for the sheer like cold brutality of it. Um, and it's told from the perspective of a child, which I think adds to that kind of surreal, bizarre humour because he doesn't really understand what's going on a lot of the time. Yeah, some incredibly beautifully written passages. For writing, I think potentially this one is one of the best, um, but it is very much like weird surreal moment, beautiful tableau, no plot, no idea what's going on and can't remember how everyone's related to one another. So. reading i've just realized how close i'm sat to this camera apologies um the other book i'm reading is the burning tigress by peter Bal balakayan which is about a history of the armenian genocide as you can tell uh not the lightest of reads um but i've only read the first like five chapters so far so we haven't got into the actual genocide part of it yet um i would say that it's pretty well written re pretty readable although the most recent chapter has been less readable because it's been a lot of like lists of places where things happened um what i would say though is that so far it's been very much focused on like america and america's reaction to the armenian genocide in the late 19th century and peter balakian is a armenian writer but i think he's an armenian like descendant living in in america rather than a person from armenia and i would be more interested in the history like the setting up being the history of the ottomans and how they why they persecuted the armenians and like how they got to this point of rather than just how americans thought about armenians um yeah it's a little americentric which i wasn't surprised which i was surprised about i didn't know was going to happen but maybe it will change more to being about um actual armenia in the rest of the book so hello it is a different day i promise but just still in my living room um so I haven't spoken to you for a while either. Um, oh, what was I gonna say? Right. So I am currently halfway through um, The Burning Tigress, uh, which is the book about the Armenian genocide that I'm reading. Uh, and also, <laughs> but we'll start with The Burning Tigress because I'm only halfway through that one. That's the last book that I'm gonna finish for this vlog. So hopefully I will finish this soon. Uh, read the rest of it today and tomorrow and get this video up but so i'm in i'm really unsure about the burning tigress um it's an important topic um there's a lot about the ottoman empire that i didn't know um basically how terrible they were to everyone who wasn't turkish um like the book is talking about uh the armenians but other christian groups as well uh like the bulgarians there was a bulgarian massacre as well um which is you know quite horrible to read about quite harrowing um and then even people who weren't uh christians like fellow muslims like arabs how they were treated in the ottoman empire uh sent to the front during the first world war in chains um etc so yeah it's quite harrowing in terms of 
uh, how it's written, <coughs> or quite harrowing in terms of the events that are happening, um, but how it's written, I'm not super enjoying. Um, so it's kind of reminding me of academic texts in a way, uh, in that there's no, it's not a story. It's not being told as a story. It's being told in a very like these other facts kind of a way. Um, with lots of lists of numbers and really factual things. Uh, and there are some first-hand sources that are interpolated, uh, which are the more harrowing parts to read because they are first-hand um, accounts of what has happened. Um, I haven't actually got to the the actual genocide yet. Um, the like, I've got to the like massacres that were happening leading up to that, um, which is still obviously harrowing. But the, uh, yeah, it's very dry and very blandly written. Um, and I'm not sure that's my favourite in terms of reading nonfiction for pleasure. Um, I would like it to be a bit more engaging and I'm finding it not very engaging. And then also, as I talked about earlier, it's very much, the first part is very much all at the American perspective and how the Americans thought about this. And then the second part is much more what was going on in the Ottoman Empire. But again, it is being told from British, French and American perspectives rather than being told on the ground. And I understand because when genocide happens, people also destroy records. Um, so external records are potentially the only things that are available to talk about. Um, although you would expect from people who fled um, and sought refuge in other parts of the world, there would be first-hand accounts from there. Um, and it just, yeah, it seems to be very like Western centric and focused on that. And I'm not really sure why, like, I don't know why the first part needed to be about Americans and about like um, suffragettes and stuff, uh, why that was relevant or important to talk about um, in this book about the Armenian genocide. Why couldn't it have been about like a potted history of Armenia in the Ottoman Empire? Because that's not something I know um, and I would, have liked to learn more about that than about the Americans. Um, it feels kind of unnecessary, but that's what we've got. Hello. So this is obviously where I began this vlog. Hang on. Um, but I have now finished all of the books. So I'm going to talk to you. So it's time to wrap them up. The only thing is I say I finished them all. I gave up. I gave up about two thirds of the way into this book. Um, I couldn't keep reading it. Whilst I still want to know more about the Armenian Genocide, and I do feel like I have learnt about what happened through this book, um, it's really not my style. It's really, really dry. Um, and I would like history with a guess more narrative to it. I'm not really sure. I'm not someone who's read a great deal of historical nonfiction, so I don't know what my preference is, but I do know that I enjoy learning about history through historical fiction. And so maybe it would have been sensible of me to pick a fictitious one of the many books that was set during the Armenian Genocide that I discovered and that are in the uh, Google Sheets doc, which is uh, linked in the description. Um, but I didn't. I went for this. I wanted to try read some nonfiction. And I just, I found it so hard and I found myself dreading picking it up. And I just, I couldn't manage it. Um, so I feel a bit disappointed with myself that I didn't persevere and do better with this. But it really, it really was taking all of my brain cells and I just... I couldn't, I couldn't make it work. So that is all of the Central Asian fiction that I've read. Um, I did enjoy some of it. Um, I do find that the, it was all focused very much on the Soviet Union and that part of the history of Central Asia, apart from the Armenian book, but that Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia are obviously a slightly different part of the world and were borderline as to where to put them. Um, whereas the actual Central Asian, Central Asian countries, I feel like, the Soviet Union has clearly still has an effect on this on those countries. It makes sense. It only fell in the early 90s. So it's, it's only been 20 years and it's still a big part. I mean, people in the UK still write about the Second World War all the time, don't they? So um, it, it wouldn't be, shouldn't be a surprise. Interesting to see the way of storytelling, the way the Dead Lake was told. Um, whilst I say that this felt much more like vignettes and much more um, visual uh, and I, I always say that I don't like it when a book tells me too much and this book just told me nothing. So <laughs> I feel like I've kind of gone too far to the other extreme. I do need a little help. Um, but the way that this was told compared to The Dead Wanderer in the Desert, there was very much similarities. Um, even repetition is a common thing, the uh, similarity that they both have repetition of phrases and ideas. Although, which I should say, repetition also happened a lot in this book and in a bad way. Like it felt like sometimes 
a paragraph had just been included twice and I not right after each other but in two separate parts but like why is the exact same paragraph included or mostly the same um but regardless <laughs> it's all about the way that this is written I can see there is a a way in which it reminds me of Russian short stories and epic poetry and I think that those two things make sense as being what they remind me of because um obviously the Soviet influence means that Russia has had a huge influence on these countries and a lot of these writers were writing in Russian as well as in their native languages. Um, and so I'm sure Russian literature is part of what they grew up reading and part of the way they cut their teeth or learning learning about writing. Um, and then also um, the translator's note for The Dead Wander in the Desert talked about uh, the oral tradition and how important that is in Kazakhstan um, and Kazakhs themselves. But the Kazakhs, um, as mentioned, were nomadic. And so nomadic cultures lend themselves to oral traditions um, because you don't have stores of written knowledge in the same way. Um, so I could feel the oral storytelling style, which has that repetition and has stock characters and archetypes um, as an important part of it. As you can tell when you read any folklore or any Greek Greek um, epic poetry, that sort of thing. They have um, a style to them that I think is because of the way that they are remembered and retold. Um, I think my favourite was The Dead Wanderer in the Desert. I really, really enjoyed that book and I think I would like to get my hands on a physical copy um, so that I can reread it again and hopefully not get quite so lost as I sometimes did when I was reading it. I really blame myself for that rather than the book itself. Um, all of these books were quite masculine is the other thing that I noticed about them. Apart from the Nadia Hashimi, they were all written by men um, and they were all writing quite a lot about very masculine worlds. Um, it would be interesting to read a book by a Central a Asian woman who lived in Central Asia because the Nadia Hashimi, she is an American, Af Afghan-American woman who grew up in America. Um, and that it was quite American sensibility, American style storytelling, um, sort of a commercial American fiction. Uh, and whilst it was, you know, um, done with, I don't want to say adequately, what's the word that I want? Accomplished writing. Um, it wasn't, wasn't my favourite because it didn't have quite the... Um, artistry that I prefer but um, it, it it's an area that I've never read from before and so it was really a interesting experience and I also enjoyed making all the food from the area I think that that's something that I might try and continue going forwards um, making food from some of the countries that I'm reading from um, the tea especially because in the dead wanderer in the desert they talk about having tea all of the time <laughs> the fact that I was having tea that was based on tea from Kazakhstan uh, really helps me get into the spirit. So let me know in the comments below, have you read anything from any books from Central Asia? Um, and what did you think of this vlog? Did, did you enjoy, uh, have you read any books from Central Asia? Have I inspired you to read any of these books from Central Asia? I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. Thank you for watching. I will be, thank you for watching. Please remember to like this video if you liked it and to subscribe. I put out new videos every Thursday and Sunday so I will see you again very soon uh, with another video and not too long until I do another round the world vlog as well. So thank you for watching. Bye bye!